I wanted to talk about this question that is often an undercurrent in anime conversations, but not brought to the surface, which is the fact that anime has always been a niche or niche thing in America. It's never really broken into the mainstream in the sense of the average American watching anime. You could argue that, you know, the average American kid watches Pokemon, right? But the average American certainly is not watching Sword Art Online or Kill a Kill or, you know, Ancient Majesty's Bride. Fair enough. So, um, the question is, what could anime as a, as a medium, as a set of creators do to get more American fans? And I should also, you know, clear one other thing up, namely, this is not necessarily a great idea. Um, you know, I, I'm not proposing this in, to suggest that anime needs more American fans, darn it. Like, how dare it not have more American fans? This is the kind of thing that might, you know, might have good effects, might have bad effects. Um, and that we are setting to the, to the side. We, you know, lots of things could have positive or negative effects. Um, the, you know, we have to narrow the question down to just what could be done to get more American fans. And once we get a grapple on that, then we can kind of think about the effects of those things, right? So yes, yeah, as Derpy uh, says in the chat room, we're not asking if this if they should. You know, if they should is a whole separate debate that is kind of off to the side for now. Um, and I think part of that is is looking at what works of anime did dramatically increase the number of fans over time. Um, I, certainly, that would include Robotech, Dragon Ball Z. That was a bit of a slow burn because Dragon Ball Z was out, you know, on various sort of random TV stations throughout America, and then it got on Toonami, and, it, you know, it, it's had this long life to better build its audience. But it definitely got, you know, a lot of people got into anime through Dragon Ball Z. Um, Akira in the 90s, Ghost in the Shell movie, I think probably both of those. Certainly both uh, expanded anime fandom. Pokemon, and I would say Naruto as the two big ones. Um, there are others that are um, getting into that territory. You know, Attack on Titan got a lot of anime fans, but I don't think it's, I don't think it's on the same scale as those others, right? So um, yeah, you know, you know, just saying, you know, make better anime that that doesn't that, that doesn't really help. I mean, that that would that would get lots of fans. Period. The question is, how do we get more American fans? I mean, I would say Haruhi did not sweep Americans and the rest of the world off their feet. Um, Haruhi was huge for existing otaku, Haruhi Suzumiya. It was, it was a massive hit there, but I, I don't know of a lot of people who got into anime through Haruhi. One or two. Um, Spin to Win brings up that problem that anime was, was marketed as basically smut back in the 2000s. I would say that was a thing from the 90s. That was the big misconception we had to deal with in the, in the 90s, which, which, which was that isn't all anime tentacle porn, basically, right? Um, hey, Bruno. I will be streaming on Twitch later when I do Otaku no Cooking. But that is definitely a misconception a lot of folks have, that anime is hyper-violent, it is sexualized, you know, maybe it is not, um, you know, X-rated, but that it is a hyper-violent sexual, you know, much more hyper-violent sexualized than your average, you know, animated series over here, which is also, you know, not inaccurate, but it's not as bad as people you know, seem to think. So that's an, an interesting, you know, so how do we get past that would be one of the questions. How, how do we beat that? Um, and certainly one of the ways would be to make something as Liquidus points out, something with more international Western ideas, Cowboy Bebop. I think Bebop is also a, a good example of a show where maybe it's not on, on the scale of a Pokemon or a Robotech in terms of getting lots of, a huge number of fans, but there are a lot of anime, a lot of fans of anime who got into it through Bebop. Um, so you just kind of have to make something that is, um, that is 
approachable to somebody who is not Japanese, where the characters aren't wearing school uniforms, where they're not, you know, going, ha 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 ha. Granted, they've avoided that to, to, to an extent. And, and you're right, Attack on Titan isn't Japanese. It, it, you know, the characters are not recognizably ethnically Japanese. They live in European-style houses, and it feels very European. I think it's one of the, the reasons for the success of um, Full Metal Alchemist, right? That, that is a European setting, so it's easier for the average American to get into it. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, and certainly Trigun is is something that American, you know, the American audience latched onto for being very familiar. It's a sci-fi western. That's we we grok we grok that very 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 simply. Now Derpy thirty three brings up a great point in the chat room: high school settings. I think that's a great point. So much of anime is aimed at, is set in high school, and we don't really do that. We, over in the West, tend to have stories set in college, set in you know, your early days as an adult, things like that. We're not really good with those things. Um, I would say, Cephalopod, it's not so much about Americans aren't very used to dealing with other cultures. Most cultures aren't used to dealing with other cultures, you know. Look at Britain. Look at, you know, any country anywhere has difficulty dealing with other cultures, right? Um, so I don't think that's, that's a problem that's unique to America. Heck, look at Japan, and China, <laughs> Korea. Um, uh, you know, and other cultures often have to, um, have to be more absorptive than say, America does, but all of those problems, I think, are, are, are still there as much as, as is reasonable. Um, <clears throat> and you're right, Jack Saba, one of, the, one of the issues is, you know, stereotypes are very hard to push past. So maybe that's an interesting question. Do they, does anime need to be, need to stop looking like anime, right? When people see big eyes, small mouth, does that just may have too many associations for them to, to push past? So do we need more stuff like Knights of Sidonia, right? Where those character designs are definitely more like anime than other things, but they're less like that, right? Um... And certainly, you know, you're, you're right, Psycho New Type. There's, you know, the, the visual appeal is part of what makes anime appeal to us, right? Uh, the mainstream media does have this issue, so that's a great question. Does maybe the anime industry needs to reach out to mainstream media and correct this misconception and show them anime and, you know, point them towards anime? recommend that they do articles on anime that break these misconceptions, right? Um, and yeah, you're right, Liquidus, this is, this is one of the, the weird things, is that, you know, Westerners have this, have a difficult time wrapping around their head around, their head around this idea of, you have all of these, all of these people, all of these heroes, all these things, and your protagonist is 15, Right? Why would that be the, the chosen hero? And that is a, a typical Japanese and indeed general Asian trope where your, your heroes tend to be relatively young. And so that is an issue. Um, well, Bruno, I don't know. I mean, the, char the, the proportions in Japanese games... I don't have much, you know, exposure to that, uh, to games. I, I think in terms of, of animation, the proportions are, are as wacky in anime as they are in other forms of animation. But uh, games are certainly different. Although I think that's, eh, I don't know. We're getting off topic with this, but I, I think that, I think that's actually a weakness in, Ameri in Western games, that all characters have to look realistic. You know, stylization is for some reason bad unless it's pixel art. 
which I think is just bizarre. But that's me. Um, yeah, and so that's a good point, Derpy. Netflix commissioning anime is a big step in the right direction. Having these things available. Although, you know, my concern is that Devil Man Cry Baby is not going to make people think that anime is less violent or less sexualized. Um, I have not seen any of it, but just based on the posters and the teasers and so forth. You know, that's a big violent show. I think that's, that has as much likelihood as reinforcing the stereotypes as breaking them. So, interesting question about, about the infrastructure, Spin to Win. Um, what do you think needs to be improved about the infrastructure? Right? Like, are you saying, and maybe this is part of it, you know, do we need to have Card Captor Sakura Clear Card on NBC at 4 p.m.? Right? Right? And that's what I'm asking, Cephalopod, is there is definitely an imbalance, so how do we correct that? How do we change that? How could the anime industry change that imbalance? What do they need to do? Well, Fisher, you know, so Fisher is saying that's not going to help because every amazing anime series they're, they're shown, they'll find five examples that push their point. If that's true, then nothing would ever change, right? No opinions would ever change ever. So there's, there's got to be some solution to that. And we've certainly seen the um, angle on anime change over time. You know, the, the, the average article about anime today is much more informed than it was in the past. Excellent point. Also, Derpy33, there's that weird difference between violence and sex. So I think here's our first, uh, yeah, our, our first thing that we, we can kind of grasp onto, if you will, is I would argue that anime needs to tone down the sexualization of its characters. Uh, you know, and we all know that there's a lot of, of, of sexualization of very young characters, and we know that it's not, it's meant in fun, but I think that gets really misinterpreted really quickly. So I think that would be, I think you're absolutely right. That would be a, a big issue. Well, it's been doing, I'm not, I, I, when I say, do we need to have Car Captain Sakura on NBC? I mean, do we need to have anime in a mainstream visible place where the average American will stumble across it? Right? You know, I, I think one of the problems is that and to that earlier point about you know Crunchyroll and or, or, or things like that is that it's kind of ghettoized at this point, if you will, not completely, but that it's easy for the average American to never watch anime, whereas if it's you know if it's there in, you know, right in front of the average American's face, would that help? I think I think it would. Exactly, Derpy. You, you know, we all appreciate the occasional Gynax bounce um, or the occasional you know, hint of a panty or panty shot or whatever. By the way, a lot of panty shots in Cutie Honey. I should have added that in the review. Every episode of Cutie Honey has multiple panty shots. And that's a great example of, of this thing where it's like, you know, the average parent, the average person is going to see that and think, oh my gosh, they're sexualizing this girl who's, I think, 16 in the show? But still, that, that, that is a hard stop for a lot of people. Um, you know, and, and let's be honest, you know, like you say, the, you know, the scene of Mirai and, and the kids bathing in 1979 Gundam, on the one hand, in context, it's very innocent. On the other hand, you have to say, well, then why is it in there? Like, why did they bother to show only the female characters nude, right? There was a, 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 an element of fan service in those scenes. So that is one of the problems, right? And by the way, I don't think TV or cable TV will die. Um, I think they will be reduced dramatically in effect. But I don't think those things are completely going away. 
Is focusing more on adults a given? That's a great question, Bruno. Maybe not. Maybe we maybe we, we should um, appeal more to to kids. That's a great point. There's so much, you know, uh, there's so many kids anime that we could have over here that nobody licenses because it's you know 900 episodes. <laughs> well, that's not what I was saying, Derpy. I was saying that scene. And I would argue that, indeed, you know, that scene with Char is there for the ladies. That is, that is fan service as well. Demographically, what does the average American otaku look like? It's an interesting question, but how is that relevant to this, to this topic? Not challenging, I'm just, I'm just curious as to what, you know, as to where you're going with that. U.S. children are well served by cartoons already. Certainly true. And granted, there's a, you know, there's always an opening. There's always a market for more stuff. But you're, you're certainly right that U.S. children so far have plenty of cartoons to watch, plenty of animation to watch. There's nothing you've seen to make you cringe in terms of sexuality of the characters or how they're portrayed. Wow. Kill a kill? Much. You know. I mean, I'll put it this way. Um, a lot of people will not buy Xenoblade Chronicles 2 on Switch because of the main female character's the female character sidekick's revealing outfit. And she's wearing much more than you'd wear in a, in a bikini, but that is a revealing outfit, right? And I'm, I'm not saying that they're wrong to say that. It is a revealing outfit. And the average, you know, American mom is going to look at that and say, no, or, or at least very much raise their eyebrows as to what kind of a game is this? Hello? Um... Well, and, and certainly, anime will never appeal to 100% of the population. I, that, that's, that's a given. The question is, if it only appeals right now to less than 1%, how can we make that 20%, right? Yeah, exactly. You know, we, we have to separate between what otaku find cool and what the average American will find cool. Or what, you know, the otaku adjacent will find cool, right? You know grandpa at 85 years old who knows what he likes is probably not going to become an anime fan overnight. Um, uh, you know, we're not looking for 100% penetration here. Mm. You know, uh, we're looking to expand. We're looking to go beyond the niche audience. Um, so you're absolutely right, Fisher. That there are certainly sexualized... Well, but here's the thing. We're not I'm, not I'm not talking sexualized female characters. I'm talking about sexualized underage female characters. You know, Mirai is not of age. Those kids are not of age. Um, you know, the vast majority of, not the vast, but, but certainly most of the sexualized characters in anime are under 18, canonically. I think that is more the problem. It's not just that they are sexualized, it's that they are, you know, under 18. Certainly under 21. Um, yeah, essentially a brainstorming session about that. Well, you don't have to get very far into Kill the Kill to see how much they sexualize those characters. You know, and how sexualized those characters' outfits are. You know, their outfits literally point at their crotches. It did not pass my episode one test, for what it's worth. But that's neither here nor there. Um, so, yeah. Great point, Derby33. You are killing it tonight. Um, you know, Long-running franchises and long-running plots are certainly a barrier to entry. To an extent, although Sopranos, right? Um, we we are moving into you know for the past five ten years, people come to expect that from you know, Mad Men and all these other shows and Breaking Bad. So I don't think that is a, that is a serious barrier to entry anymore. I think people kind of expect that. Walking Dead. 
Um, yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think you can. You can. Uh, uh, and just say all the characters are eighteen now. Mm -hmm. Which we could. And I know you're joking, but uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I, but I, I certainly think sexualization of young characters is is something that's holding it back, right? For better or worse, for whatever reason. Um, I. Spin to win, I'm with you on that, on, on Kill a Kill. I, I agree. Um, one of these days I'll probably have to watch it, but whatever. Um, sexualization. Like I said, I don't think violence is a problem. I think that's just something we're kind of used to. I think, you know, we'll have to be careful about violence because th there tends to be absurd, over-the-top violence in anime to an extent that we rarely get in our media. Uh, so, I, you know, because anime, because you can do anything in animation, they often do in the violence. So that's one of those things where, you know, let's not push some of the hyper-violent stuff out there. But like I said, I, I don't think that's, that's a big, a big problem. And especially, you know, most anime, most action anime is not that violent. We, you know, anime generally doesn't get that extreme in terms of those, that stuff. Um, but then you, you do get into those cultural things. You know, shows starring teenagers are a tough sell in America. So let's, let's again, let's, let's kind of think about what this would look like. So imagine more anime starring adult characters, maybe young adult characters. Uh, and let's say like Omagadas as, as an example. Um, or even Pet Girl Sakuraso. You know, where it's characters in college, right? Or about to, to or, you know, around college age characters. I think that's a, that is something that we could handle more. But would still be young enough to be still dealing with their problems, and I totally grant that you know high school is different from college, and it's definitely different. You know, college in Japan is very different than college in America. But I think that that would help. Or young adults I had this problem with one of my um, anime panels, where somebody said, "I want more anime that's like Ghost in the Shell, anime that is about." Um, groups of adult professionals working together. I was like, ah, ah, ah. you know, I, I, we came up with one or two, but that's just not anime's thing. And I think that kind of stuff would definitely have a chance of breaking out. More anime about adult professionals. Um, I mean, certainly, you know, Darker Than Black would be an example. Um, yeah, criminal investigation setting. It, Ghost in the Shell has a problem that it, it's near future, and it's a very specific version of that future. It, you know, it has very specific technologies that Shiro thought of, so it's, it's less approachable than your average sort of near future kind of sci-fi show. Um, so I think that's, that's a problem. It, it's you know, it's kind of like The Expanse, where sci-fi fans adore The Expanse, and they can show it to a non-science fiction fan who might appreciate it and enjoy it, but The Expanse is not going to appeal to the average American, or, you know, much beyond the science fiction world. Nope, says Sevapod, that's, that's, I'm glad you brought that up. Americans are not used to drama in an animated form. So. Do we need more goofy comedies? You know, what if America was flooded with screwball comedies in anime form? You know, Nichijo, or whatever. And then now Nichijo does, you know, have very, it's very much said in a Japanese school. But in you know, Azamanga Daio, or Akadocha, or whatever. I've not seen Monster, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm aware of it. So yeah, I, I agree. Something like Monster would definitely appeal to a general American audience. Um... Yeah, I think Ghost in the Shell could find its audience. Um, actually, well, I see. I disagree because of the major's outfit. I have a good friend of mine who enjoys anime. She is an anime fan, and she cannot take Ghost in the Shell seriously because of her outfit in Sandalone Complex. You know, walking around in a bustier all the time in a, in a corset is you know is just absurd to her, which it is. No, and, and you're right, Derpy. There, you know, comedy has a problem. Yeah, and, um, 
comedy has a problem in that there are definitely forms of Japanese comedy that do not translate well to American comedy. They're just different approaches to comedy. Uh, some of them work in American, some, you know, some of them work for American, some of them don't. Um, and again, you have that, that, that pun problem. But I, I think you could, you could certainly find humor and find elements that w would translate, right? That come across understandably to people. Um, Azumanga Dayo is a great example of that, I think. I think it's almost the, the canonical example where it's about a group of high school girls playing around. There is a really bad translation problem in Azumanga Dayo in episode one, um, which is unfortunate. Um, it's not a translation problem, actually, because there's no line of dialogue. It is the visuals on the screen and the fact that in the anime they don't kind of explain it in the same way they explain it in the manga. Um, so like they sh you know, the translation should have added a line that wasn't there to explain that, you know, we, this image means something different in America. Um, but I think that is just about, you know, schoolgirls hanging out and being goofy. Right. So Ghibli. Ghibli's something definitely to talk about. Ghibli is certainly one of those things, and that's one of the ones I should have brought up earlier. The Studio Ghibli has absolutely made anime fans in America. That's been a, a slow burn, but yeah, absolutely. So that's tough because you need family films, right? You need a, a family, and not just films, but just a, a story about uh, you know, and people and adventures and such. Um, something that, that isn't action per se, it's not drama per se, it has those elements. Uh, Spin to win, you have not met a lot of Steven Universe fans, right? Who will talk your ear off about how Steven Universe is is full of symbolism and imagery and, and all sorts of important stuff. I, you know, I haven't watched it, so I don't know, but... Or, yeah, Boondocks. My gosh. Boondocks, definitely. And, I mean, Batman the Animated Series. That's a dang impressive show. But anyway. Um, so, you're right, Bruno. Film is a lot easier for folks to consume, and I, I think, because film tends to be more self-contained. There's a lot more there that folks can, you know can approach. Um, yeah, you know, Batman the Animated Series was animated in Japan. That's absolutely true. Um, uh, so that's an interesting question. Is it maybe TV is the wrong, you know, uh, the wrong paw to grab in this? Maybe we should think more about films. That films is worth approaching. Um... And that gets to the point that, you know, Akira and Ghost in the Shell definitely worked to get more anime fans. So maybe we do need something. That's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent point that is like that. So as, we, as we've sort of talked about, um, something that is not hypersexualized, something, or, or you know, does not sexualize underage characters, um, something that is not hyper, hyper violent, uh, and something where the protagonists are not all 14 years old, right, in general. That will certainly help. Um, yeah, exactly, uh, Derpy. And, it, and, and you bring up a, another great point, Derpy, which is finding stuff, or, you know, if the industry could build stuff, build stuff that the average fan is going to be comfortable recommending to somebody, where... 
especially if you're introducing somebody to anime, you kind of want to sit down and watch it with them. So that if there is something they don't quite understand, you can explain to them. And films would, would work. Recognizable voice actor. Interesting question, psycho, or interesting point, psycho new type. Um, so Armitage the Third, the film, famously was, uh, was dubbed by um, uh, Kiefer Sutherland. And, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the female actor's name. But a famous female actor, they, they dubbed Armitage the Third partly for that reason, because it was a, a violent science fiction movie, they felt that they could actually, you know, this could actually appeal to the, a broader audience. Uh, the problem is that they were not very good voice actors. Uh, great actors, but they just, you know, get, get them behind a microphone and it didn't really work. Um, but that, I think, has been fixed. I, I think we're now at a point where we can get recognizable voice actors and you know the industry has self-corrected for that that there's been enough that there have been enough recognizable film actors dubbing things that we can get past that um although a lot of times when you see a recognizable voice talent credited in an anime film often a lot of their lines were actually dubbed by a cartoon or anime voice actor who matched their voice but that's a whole nother thing so yeah i think that would certainly that's a, that would be huge get some films that work for the american audience um and you know uh you know, can go for there um and do something that is again like a ghost in the shell um, or maybe like, like a Studio Ghibli film, you know, you do something that is more open to people, uh, and make it something that is, you know, and, and again, you know, dub it so it's more like what the original, you know, people were experiencing. Um, as you all know, I have strong feelings about sub, subs versus dubs. Um, yeah, so I think that that's a, a really interesting point. So maybe, maybe we start with movies. Maybe we try to get more of those films. Because one of the problems is, you know, I was really hoping that Mamoru Hosoda would push that forward, and so I watch Wolf Children, and I'm like, this is gonna, this is ideal for introducing people to anime. And then there's a scene early on where the main, where you know, a girl sleeps with a werewolf, and just the, and she's college age. Uh, they're both college age, but it's still just kind of, it, it, mm, the mind kind of goes in weird ways in that, you know, in a way that Americans see and that the average, you know, Asian audience, I would argue, is, is more willing to kind of sit back and let, let that roll over them and say, okay, weird, like, like you know, they're not saying, oh, well, that's normal, um, but they're more willing to accept that as a, um, uh, you know, an odd consequence of this. Than the average Westerner will. Uh, why was your name so successful in America? Was it? I mean, how successful was it in America? I know it did well. Yeah, I know. It, I, I know it did better than the average, uh, you know, anime film that just kind of appears and then, you know is out for half a minute in, in theaters. And, and I, I'm not trying to be, you know, um, dismissive there. I'm, I'm honestly asking, how well did it do? Because that will help give us a sense of, you know, okay, was this a, a medium spike or a massive spike? Hmm. Collaborations. True. J.J. Abrams, you know, is interested. Although, I mean, you know, James Cameron did Battle Angel Alita, or was going to, and that never did very well. Um, so that may just be more J.J. Abrams being intrigued by the concept. Um, but you're right, that, that is definitely a sign that it, it, it didn't just completely die. Um, so collaborating with anime studios to make anime. Well, the thing is, we, we, Marvel did that. You know, we we had half you know, we had what three or four different Marvel anime series, and that didn't those didn't really go anywhere. 
which surprised me. I thought those would attract an, an American audience, and they did show on American television, I think, didn't they? Didn't like the Iron Man anime series air over here? Interesting, Bruno, that, yeah, your name came out in theaters, no one, no one really mentions it. And granted, that's one of the issues with theater releases, is that, yes, a lot of anime is released in theaters for a day. And it's, which, you know, I'm not faulting the studios for the fact that they cannot afford to put $4 million into putting this in every theater in America, right? That's just impossible. Um, but, there we go. Um, oh, I, I would disagree that Your Name is Shinkai's worst film. I, I, I will put, um, um, uh, uh, um, Voices of an Innocent Star below Your Name. Both impressive, but. Made a million in its limited run in Australia. That's impressive. Definitely impressive. So, but, but to, your, to that point, your name certainly got attention. It got a respectable theatrical release in the sense that, you know, it did not come out for three minutes. Um, and people went to see it. It, it certainly got that attention. So what was it about that film? I think because it wasn't an overtly fantasy film, right? They weren't traveling to an alternate world. Um, it wasn't Spirited Away or Nausicaa or whatever. You know, it didn't have a strong sci-fi fantasy pre uh, presence. Um, and it was basically a romance story. I think that's what attracted people. Also, very good, um, um, very good marketing for your name in terms of the fact that, like, you see the poster for your name and. The, the anime style character art is always small relative to all the amazing, gorgeous artwork around it, right? Um, yeah, and I, I don't think Adult Swim Toonami or, or, or Junami are, are going to be the key there because they just don't have the, um, the wherewithal, they don't have the budget to do anything big and long term with anime, unfortunately. Like I say, you know, you, you get. Big O Season 2 and Furry Curry and things like that, which is great, but those are very niche things. They're very niche, you know, um, uh, premises and concepts that they're, they're funding. Even like IGPX, right? Um, and unfortunately, Adult Swim goes through so many different um, uh, ownership changes, so many different VPs working at different times, that they'll start working with something, and then it will... Um, you know, it'll fall apart because a new regime comes in. Uh, so I, I just don't think, unfortunately, Cartoon Network has the, the capacity for that because that would make a lot of sense. That would, be, that would work in this very well. But I just don't think we're going to, I don't think we're gonna, we, can, we can make that work. Annoying. Um, but yeah, I love that. So films aimed at a, uh, or, you know, about slightly older characters that doesn't sexualize them too much. Again, that's one of the problems I have with, with um, not the, the problems, but one of the difficulties with recommending your name to people is that, you know, it has a lot of characters of a, a guy essentially fondling another girl's breasts, right? Multiple times throughout the show, uh, throughout the movie. And that's just hard to, to you know, it's hard to explain to people, you know, the, the average, the average person, like they get the joke the first time and then they're like, this is kind of in your face. So, okay. I think we have covered this really, really well. Uh, I want to thank you all very much for, uh, for diving into this topic with me. I think this is really interesting. And, um, this is not the last time we'll talk about this topic. We'll, we'll be, uh, coming back for, for more on this topic. Uh, on, on these sorts of topics soon. In fact, I want to talk about the question of what fans can do to make anime more, more popular in America. Right? Not just what those people over there, but what could we do to improve the lot of anime in America? But anyway, 
So again, thank you all very much for joining me and we'll be back with more of this next time.